It is time for us to begin our Bible class this evening. We're in the book of Acts, and we're going to be in chapter 8 in just a moment. Acts, the 8th chapter, and uh, talking about the evangelistic work of Philip. But before we get started there, if you'll please bow with me, we'll go to God in a word of prayer. Our wonderful God and our Father, we're thankful for this day. We're grateful for this opportunity we have to come together and to open up our Bibles and study. We are grateful for thy word, for its simplicity, for its availability. We pray, Father, that we would feed upon it each and every day of our life. We pray, Father, that we learn from the example of men like Stephen and Philip and the apostles and others as we study the early church. We pray, Father, that we might gain inspiration from them as we see their uh, relationships with one another, as we see their efforts in spreading the gospel and their uh, courage under adversity. We pray, Father, that we might imitate them, that we might grow closer to Thee, and that we might share the gospel with others. We're mindful, Father, that we have some of our number that are not here due to uh, battling various ailments, and we pray, Father, Your rich blessings upon them and the doctors that are caring for them. Also, we know there are many family members that are on the minds of, of those here, and we ask Your blessings upon them. We pray, Father, for those that might be struggling spiritually, and we pray, Father, that we would encourage and help them. At this time, Father, we ask for forgiveness that we can stand clean and pure as we went into our period of Bible study. We're grateful for the forgiveness that you have provided through your Son. Help us to appreciate that more daily. Help us to think of the great love he had for us, and may that love constrain and compel us to be everything that we need to be in thy service. Continue with us through this hour. Continue with us through the remainder of our lives. We pray, Father, in the end, we'll have been faithful to thee so heaven can be our home. For this is our prayer in your Son's blessed name. Amen. Let's begin very very briefly by reviewing what we've talked about. The key verse in the book of Acts, Acts 1 and verse 8, where the the Holy Spirit was going to come upon the apostles and they were going to be witnesses to him in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that's what the book of Acts is about. It's the early church as it spreads throughout the entire world. And so our basic outline of Acts, Acts 1 through 7, the gospel is in Jerusalem. And that's where we have been focused in our study up to this point in time. In our chapter tonight, Acts 8 through Acts chapter 12, the gospel is going to go into Judea and Samaria. And then in chapter 13 through chapter 28, it is going to go to the uttermost parts of the world. So much so that by the time the book of Acts ends, or about the time the book of Acts ends, Paul is in prison. And in one of those prison epistles that he writes, the book of Colossians, he said that the gospel had been heard by every creature under heaven. And so from that small beginning in Acts chapter 2, within 30 years, the gospel had gone throughout the entire entire world. And we tried to memorize our chapter content as we go through, and so let's go through that very quickly. What's Acts 1 about? I'd put it up here, but then you could read it. What's Acts 1 about? It's about, it's about the ascension of Christ and the selection of Mattathias. Acts 2 is the beginning, uh, the beginning of the church, the, the establishment of the church, however you want to remember it. Acts 3, the healing of a lame man uh, that is going to set the stage for the trying of the apostles. Acts 4, of course, is Peter and John are arrested there before the Sanhedrin council. Acts 5 is what? To Ananias and Sapphira and back to court they go before the Sanhedrin. Acts 6, the, the, fir, the, the first church problem, the, the neglecting of the Hellenist widows. However you want to remember that, that's what Acts 6 is about. Acts 7 is the first Christian martyr or the death of Stephen. And so that brings us to where we are now, which is in Acts chapter 8 that focuses on the work of Philip. When the chapter begins, uh, we are talking about Saul. We had been introduced to him last week. Who was Saul? He was a young man at this point in time. And what had he done during the the, the stoning of Stephen? He had held their coats. And now when we get to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it tells us how did he feel about that execution of Stephen? 
He was consenting to it. He was giving his approval. I think it's the New American Standard Version that said he gave hearty approval to his execution. And so at that point in time, with the death of Stephen, now a great persecution is going to arise against the church. And what happens is as a result of that persecution, the Christians are going to be scattered where? Throughout Judea and Samaria. That relates us back to Acts 1.8, doesn't it? Remember Acts 1.8? The gospel is going to go to Jerusalem and then into Judea and Samaria. And so now the Christians had sort of been concentrated there in Jerusalem, but as a result of this persecution now, they're going to be scattered. Everybody except who? The apostles. Why did they stay behind? Why didn't they scatter? Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us. A uh, variety of explanations have been given. Some are that they just decided we're going to see this thing through and no matter what happens, we believe God's going to be with us. Um, some have suggested that while they were persecuting the Christians, they sort of left the apostles alone because they'd seen some of the miracles they performed and they were afraid uh, to confront them. I, I really doubt that's the case, particularly in light of the fact that in Acts 4 and 5, they had arrested the apostles and drugged them before the Sanhedrin council. I think it's more likely that the apostles just decided they weren't going to be run out of the city and they were going to stay there and continue to preach the gospel. But others were scattered throughout the region. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. The word devout means God-fearing. And this is probably a reference to other Christians. It at times in the book of Acts refers to religious Jews in Acts 2, but here in all likelihood it's other Christians. And when they buried Stephen, they, they, they lamented that. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, Roper suggests in his commentary that according to Jewish principle and Jewish law, it was illegal to mourn over one that they thought was a criminal in any way. And they'd accused uh, Stephen of criminality and blaspheming and speaking against the Lord and that this reaction by, the, uh, by these devout men shows they weren't afraid at all of the Jewish leaders and they were going to mourn regardless of what they thought. I don't know if that's true or not, but at least he suggests that it could be. At the same time, what is Saul beginning to do now? He's making havoc of the church. I like the ESV. He said he's ravaging the church. Uh, this is a word that in the Greek is actually used for wild animals that just take and just tear their prey apart. And so just like a wild animal. Have you ever seen maybe a, a television show about the wild animals out in the, uh, the wilderness and they'll take another animal and they'll just rip them to shreds. And that's the word here that is used to describe what Saul was doing. He's ravaging the church. I mean, he is just trying to tear it apart. In fact, other passages give us a little bit more insight as to the kind of things that he was, that he was doing. Look over in Acts 22 and verse 4. How far did Saul of Tarsus go in this persecution? Acts 22, 4. He persecuted the way what? To the death. Binding and delivering to prison both men and women. It didn't matter if he was man or woman. He didn't care, and he'd persecute you even all the way until death. If you're still in Acts 22, look at verse 19. What did it say he did? One, one synagogue, or some after another, what did he do? He imprisoned and, and, and beat people that believed in the Lord. If he found somebody believing in the Lord, he'd take and he'd, he'd beat them. Over in Acts chapter 26 and in verse 10, when, people were, when prisoners were put on trial, and, and by the way, all of this activity that Saul is doing, who's given him that authority? The, G, the chief priests, the Jewish leaders are. And so he said, I received authority from them. But when they were put to death, what did he do? He cast his vote, cast his vote against them. And so he was voting to put these Christians to death and in verse 11, he said, I punished them often. And he even tried to what? Compel them to blaspheme and persecuted them even unto foreign cities. So when you think about this persecution coming under Saul, how intense was it? It's, it's very intense, even to the point of death. One commentator said, I, I picture Saul going into house after house 
taking men and women, maybe in front of their own children, binding their hands and, and taking them out. Uh, Paul later would say, when it came to the zeal with which I persecuted the church, you're not finding anybody that what? That was more zealous than what I, than what I was. Uh, here's a picture of a prison that would have existed. This is under a, a Catholic church that's built there now, but this is a, a tradition. Jesus was put here awaiting trial, but there's no evidence of that. But it, it, it dates back to that point in time, and it would give you the, the idea of the kind of prison that down in this sort of dungeon and in those places they would have placed those Christians, uh, or at least something similar to that, to await their trial before the court and then try to put them uh, to, to death. And so when this persecution arises here in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, because of that, the Christians are going to be scattered throughout, the, throughout the, the area of Judea and Samaria. You might have thought that these Christians would have just kept the message to themselves. After all, look at what trouble it got us into in Jerusalem. But what did they do? They went everywhere preaching the word. And this is not the typical word preach that's used in the New Testament. It's the word uh, from which we get uh, our word evangelism, uh, euangelio. And it really means that they were proclaiming good news. In other words, they went everywhere proclaiming the gospel and telling others about the Lord. Whose responsibility is that? Christians. All Christians. It wasn't just the work of the apostles. It wasn't just the work of Philip and Stephen but it was the work of all men, and they went everywhere preaching the word. And then after that, we, we devote ourselves specifically to Philip. Um, this is uh, really the, the, the first time in Acts 8 that we come back to a detailed conversion since the day of Pentecost, where things are given in detail. Some have referred to the events of Acts 8 as what they call a, a bridge conversion. And by bridge conversion, what they mean is it is a conversion that is going to lead to greater opportunities later on. For example, who's the gospel been taught to up to this point in time? Jews only. In Acts 8, we're going to see the gospel opened up to Samaritans. And maybe even, though we don't know for sure, it may be that it is a Jewish proselyte or a non-Jew in the case of the Ethiopian eunuch. Another bridge conversion that they talk about is Acts 10. That's the household of Cornelius because with him, now you're opening the door to all uncircumcised Gentiles. And, and some argue that every time you see a detailed conversion given in the book of Acts, that it's given because it's bridging to a, to a greater opportunity for others to hear the gospel. And so you have that here in Acts chapter Acts chapter 8. What do we know about Philip, this, this preacher that goes about goes to Samaria and later to the Ethiopian eunuch. What do you know about him? He was one of what? Of Acts 6. So what does that tell us about it? Well, he's a man that's full of the Holy Spirit. He's a man full of faith. Um, later on in the book of Acts, what do we know about him? Anybody remember? He had, he had virgin daughters that prophesied. That tells me he must have been a good family man that had raised his children up in the right way. And he comes down to the city of Samaria, and there he's going to preach the gospel. So here what happens from Jerusalem. He's going to go up to the city of Samaria, and it's about between 30 and 40 miles north of Jerusalem, and there he's going to preach the gospel. Tell me something about the Samaritans very briefly and what the Jews' attitude was toward them. They hated them. They, they were sort of a mixed, mixed breed of, uh, of, of people. They, they came from the, the, the intermingling of those that had been brought in in 2 Kings chapter uh, 17. And so you remember the, the Samaritan woman in John 4 and 9, when Jesus talked to her, what did he say, she say? I mean, I'm shocked you're even talking to me because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And so these are people that were part Jew, part Gentile, in some ways, they were part God worshipers, part idol uh, worshipers. And here the gospel is being proclaimed uh, to them. They're hearing the gospel for the first time, and they're going to receive and accept that gospel. What, what is Philip's topic when he gets there? In verse 8, verse 5, rather. 
He preached Christ. Now, what's preaching Christ going to involve? That's an important question. You ever heard somebody say, we just need to preach Christ and, you know, leave everything else alone. We need to preach Christ, but not the church. Well, when Philip came and he preached at Samaria and he preached Christ, what did he preach? He preached about what? He talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, no doubt. But look down in verse, with me here in Acts chapter 8, and in verse 12, what did he preach about? He preached about baptism. because they got to be, So preaching Christ means preaching baptism. What else did they preach about? He preached about the, the kingdom of God, which is what? The church. Preaching Christ means preaching about his kingdom. It means preaching about his church. Uh, preaching in the name of Jesus means preaching about the authority. Of Jesus, All those things are included in this preaching about Jesus, more than talking about just his death, burial, and resurrection. That's included in that, but much more than that as he preaches here to the Samaritans. And they, they, they listened to this message, particularly in verse 6, when they saw what? They saw the miracles. Better translated the word sign. Um, the word that's translated miracles there in the New King James is a word... Uh, uh, I think it's uh, see me amon, but it, it, it's the word for like a mile marker or a sign. It occurs 77 times, I think, in the uh, in the word translated that in the New Testament. 74 of those times, the New King James translates it as sign. And here they translated miracle. The word that's typically translated word miracle is the word from which we get our word dynamite. And that talks about the power. And that, that, that's actually a word that occurs a little bit later on here in our same text, verse 13, when you have signs and miracles performed in verse 13, you have both of those words occurring together. So uh, it is better translated as sign. These signs, why was he doing these miracles? Because they were a sign pointing to the fact that he was speaking from... God, that he was speaking from the Holy Spirit, and that's why that word is preferable there. And they hear this message, and there's much, there's much joy in the city. And particularly, he draws attention to one character here at Samaria, and who is that? A man by the name of Simon. We call him Simon the sorcerer, typically. What is he doing in the city? What, is he ha what has he done? He's practiced sorcery. Um, again, I would probably better translate that magic. The word there in the Greek is actually the word from which we get our word magic. It's a different word that's translated sorcery in Galatians chapter 5. And, and this is a little bit different than what we think of as magic today from this standpoint. You know, if you go to a magic show today and, or you see some great illusionist, they're really quite up front in saying all of this is what? It's sleight of hand. It's an illusion. It's, it's designed for one purpose, and that's for entertainment. But in this case, what is Simon doing? He's trying to do it for gain and trying to convince the people that he himself was what? Someone great. And, and they had been fooled by him. In fact, from the least to the greatest of them, in fact, for a long time... Verse 11, uh, he had amazed them with his sorcery or his magic. And so if you'd come into the city of Samaria prior to Philip being there and performing his signs, they were all uh, deceived by Simon. They, they were convinced he was somebody great. But now Philip comes in and he does his signs. And when he preaches the gospel, verse 12, they believe Philip as he preached uh, the good news about the kingdom of God or preached uh, uh, that about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, what did this crowd see between Philip and Simon? Do you think? He's, they, they saw the difference in the sleight of hand and the deceptive nature of Simon and Philip who was genuinely what? Performing miracles. Who else saw a difference between Simon and Philip? Simon saw a difference. You know, um, he, he saw that there was something different about Philip and what he did. That Philip wasn't just deceiving people. He was genuinely performing these miracles. And so what was the response of the people and of Simon? They believed and they were baptized. 
because they saw these signs. And so uh, the, the crowd saw the difference in the fraud in the case of Simon and in the authentic in the case of Philip. Did Simon genuinely obey the gospel? Yeah. There's no indication that it wasn't. There, there's a lot of theories built on Simon, and, and a lot of them have to do with the fact that Simon just never did really obey the gospel. One reason for that is the once saved, always saved doctrine. If you're going to defend that, you can't have him falling away, so you have to argue that he never did really obey the gospel. In fact, there's there, in, in some material... They actually have Simon later being the guy that starts the Gnostic doctrine. I mean, and he's just a charlatan and a, and a deceiver. But, but what I want you to notice here in verse 12 and verse 13 is the same word that is used to describe the response of the crowd is the same word that is used to describe Simon. Both men and women, they believed Philip, but verse 13 said Simon himself what? He believed. So the same word that is used to describe the others is used to describe uh, Simon. And uh, I believe that means that he had genuinely and fully obeyed the gospel. Now, after they had obeyed the gospel, word came back to the apostles at Jerusalem about the response in Samaria. And so they sent Peter and John down to Samaria. Why did they send them to Samaria? To impart the Holy Spirit. They didn't come to teach them what they needed to do. Philip was fully capable of teaching the truth. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit in what he did. He was fully capable in telling them what they needed to do in order to be saved. But there was something that Philip could not do. And that is he could not impart the gifts of the Holy Spirit to these individuals. In fact, look at what it said. They, in verse 14, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen on any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they, that is Peter and John, laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through what? laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. So this is one of the few passages we have that talks about specifically the passing on of spiritual gifts uh, to others. And what this tells us is that Philip couldn't do that. Why couldn't Philip do that? He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't an apostle. And it took the laying on of the apostles' hands. Simon observed that. And so... But by logic then, we could sort of put this in a syllogism. If spiritual gifts were passed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, that's point number one. Point number two, there are no apostles today, and there hasn't been for what? Thousands of years, nearly 2,000 years. Um, then what does that tell you about spiritual gifts today? There's nobody, there are no spiritual gifts today because there's no way for that to be passed to be passed on. And so uh, the apostles received the Holy Spirit directly from God in Acts 2, but all others received that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and they were the only ones that could impart that gift. Why was that important, by the way, at this point in time? Revelation hadn't been completed yet. And so you establish a church in Samaria. It's much different. If you and I went and established a church somewhere but tried to plant the seed, then the, the new converts there, the teachers there, would have what? The word of God to guide them. But think about the, the work here. Philip comes and he preaches the gospel at Samaria, and they obey it. Philip is not staying there. He's going to go other places preaching the word. And if nobody there had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what would have happened to that church? They, they would have had no guidance. They would have known what they needed to do. And so... They needed the apostles to come and to impart that to them so that they would know what they needed to do in order to please God. We don't need those gifts today because we have the completed and the perfect revelation of God given, given to us. Now, Simon saw that. Now, remember this, by the way, that in, in somewhat of a defense of Simon, a weak defense of Simon. When Simon obeyed the gospel, 
It'd be much like somebody today, for example, hearing the gospel. Maybe, maybe it's a guy that he runs a liquor store. And now he's heard the gospel preached and he's obeyed it. What's he going to have to do? He's going to have to give that up. Why? Because that's sinful. Well, same thing is true. How had Simon been making a living? Deceiving people by this deception. And so now he's obeyed the gospel. He knows I've got to what? Give all that up. And I think Simon is probably looking for a way that I'm going to continue, number one, to provide for a living, and maybe more important to him, that I'm still going to be someone what? Important and great in the eyes of the people. And so what offer does Simon make? Yeah. I'll, I'll buy the ability that y'all have with money. Give me this power so that anyone that I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what was Peter's response to him? Number one, it's not for sale. God, uh, Which of God's gifts, by the way, are for sale? None of them are. But particularly here he's talking about the, the gift of the passing on of the Holy Spirit. He said, may your money or your silver perish with you, for you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. He was sincere, I think, in his thinking, but you're wrong in that you can't buy it. You don't have any part in this matter, and your heart is not right with God. And so your, your attitude, your outlook... In fact, when he said his heart is not right, he describes that in verse 23 when he said that he was in the what? You're poisoned by bitterness. Literally, you're in the gall of bitterness. That, that gall is that, you know, that, uh, that yellow bile, nasty bile that is produced uh, in... Uh, in the body, and when he says that you are poisoned by bitterness, is literally you are in the gall of uh, bitterness. Um, S.I.L. says the noun denotes the bitter, yellowish liquid secreted by the governor and uh, by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. And the idiom in the gall of bitterness means to be particularly envious or resentful of someone. In other words. What, what was motivating Simon that he said, your heart's not right? It seems he was motivated by bitterness because he had been used to sort of being the center of attention and now he wasn't the center of attention anymore. Nobody was looking at him like they were someone great. he was someone great, but they're looking to Peter and John. And so it seems that he was bitterly envious or bitter with jealousy, God's word translation says. And then he was in the bond of iniquity. So what was the remedy for Simon? He needed to repent. What is the word repent? Change. You need to change your thinking. Yes. Yeah. Right. He did. He, he, he enjoyed that. That, that. that feeds almost anybody's ego when, 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 they, when uh, they're getting that kind of attention. And so now that had come to an abrupt end. And, and so he was told you can repent of this year wickedness and pray to the Lord that perhaps or if possible the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Why would Peter say if possible or perhaps? Was the impossibility with God... It was with Simon. It was all dependent upon what? The way he thought in his attitude. So if you approach it in the right way, the Bible tells us that God is faithful and just, forgive us of our sins, and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you've got to repent and pray to God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. What was uh, Simon's response to that after Peter told him he was in the gall of bitterness and bound by iniquity? He asked him to pray for him. It surprises me the number of commentators that are sort of critical of Simon for that. Uh, that, that somehow he, he was shirking the responsibility and telling, you know, Peter, you know, you pray for me. I don't see it that way at all. In fact, you know, what I see is a principle that's found in other passages. What is it James said in James chapter 5? Confess your trespasses one to another and what? Pray one for another. That you may be healed. I don't know how many times through the years I've had somebody that'll say, "Would you pray for me?" You know, and it's not an indication of a lack of uh, of faith. 
It, it may be an indication that Philip or that Simon was much more comfortable with Peter praying for him. Um, th there are some, by the way, Western texts, very few, that in the manuscripts there actually have that Simon weeped unconsolably and said, uh, Peter, pray for me. If, that, if that's an indica any, any indication as to how he responded, here's a man that is deeply mourning over what is done, and he asked Peter to pray for him that nothing of what you have said may come uh, upon me. Did, did Simon genuinely repent and change after that? I wish I knew more about Simon's life after that but we're just sort of left with it at that point in, that point in time. I'll tell you what I do learn from practical takeaways up to this point in time. We've talked a little bit about what it means to preach Christ, but I also learned something about the gospel reaches some unusual converts. I mean, if, if, if you start looking through the book of Acts and we start just making a list, maybe we should as we go through the book of Acts, of the people that obeyed the gospel, it's a pretty... Uh, interesting group of people. Um, in Acts chapter uh, 8 here, we have a man that was a liar and a charlatan and a deceiver. I mean, how many people, how many of us would have gone into Samaria and said, you know, who needs to hear the gospel? That, that Simon, he'd be, a, he'd be a great candidate. You know, or you think about people that murdered the Lord in Acts chapter 2. How many of us would have said 40 or 50 days later, excuse me, that those same people that had cried out to the Lord, crucify him, you know what? I bet some of them will, will respond. The murder in the case of, of, of Saul. On and on you go through the New Testament. What does that tell you about the gospel? It's for all. It's, it's for all. And planted in good and honest hearts, it can bring about a change that is, uh, that is powerful. And it does so in the case of, uh, of Simon uh, the sorcerer here. And so I, I learned something about... In fact, verse 13, the way it's worded, I'm looking here at the English Standard Version... When they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. There's something about the way that's worded to me. Even Simon, that he heard the gospel. Has there ever been anybody you've sort of written off, maybe at work and other places because of the sins they're involved in? You think, well, they, they wouldn't be interested. But you know what? If they heard the gospel, the story may be even what? Even they might respond. And so the gospel's for all men. I also learned that there's a possibility of us losing our salvation if we obey the gospel. There is no indication that Simon wasn't genuine and sincere, but when he went back into sin, what Peter said to him is, you're bound by iniquity. And so uh, that, that in Acts chapter 8 refutes this idea of once saved, always saved. He found himself back in a lost condition. And I also learn in that that when we go back into sin after we've obeyed the gospel, that God will take us back if we what? If we repent and genuinely turn. Any other uh, comments or practical lessons before we talk about the latter part of this, of this chapter? Well, notice Peter prayed that Peter be made to be baptized. Right. Uh, that, that would be a sufficient condition. That's right. He wasn't told to re be, uh, be baptized again. There was a different law of pardon for him. And that is initially he had to be baptized, but now he had to repent and to pray. And so one law of pardon for the alien sinner, another for the erring child of God. Well, after the work at Samaria, and he continued to preach the gospel and return to Jerusalem, and the gospel goes to many of the villages or cities of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go to the south toward the road that goes from Jerusalem to, to Gaza, for behold, there's a, a man there uh, that is wanting to hear... Uh, the gospel, and we're going to talk about that story here. An Ethiopian, a eunuch of great authority under Queen Candace. So here's the road, by the way, that goes from Jerusalem over here uh, to Gaza. Ashdod is going to be uh, the last place mentioned here under a different name at the end of the chapter. But this is the, the road that he's going to travel on. Uh, what would you say about this, this candidate for conversion that uh, Philip is going to talk uh, to. What do we know about him? He's a religious man. He's gone all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, what else do we know about him? He had, he had a lot of authority. He was a court official under Queen Candace. Candace, by the way, is a 
uh, a, a, a name much like Pharaoh. It's not a personal name, but it is a, a title that was given to the rulers there. And so it doesn't help us really in identifying specifically who's talked about here. But he was a person of great authority. You know, the Bible says not many that are mighty after the flesh are called, but not many is not the same as not any. Sometimes the gospel has reached even those who are very, uh, very powerful. Uh, what do we know about his ethnic background? He's from Ethiopia. We really don't know a lot. Um, it is possible Ethiopia had a large Jewish population. It is possible that he could have been a, a, a Jew that lived in Ethiopia. Uh, more likely he may have been a uh, Jewish uh, proselyte in some way. Um, though I'm going to mention that again in just a moment. Um, uh, the color of his skin, he might well have been a black man, but there's a lot of speculation that's involved in, in identifying him uh, in, in one way or another. We just don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It really doesn't matter because who's the gospel for? It's for everyone. And so uh, he's an Ethiopian. One reason I say that if he was a, a, um, a Jewish proselyte or a Jew, uh, he would not have allowed, been allowed to fully partake in the, the worship, because Deuteronomy 23 and verse 1 specifically said a man that had been emasculated or who had been uh, castrated was not allowed to be part of the assembly and worship. So if he was a Jewish proselyte or a Jew, when he went to Jerusalem and worship, there are certain things he would not have been allowed to participate in under the old law as a, uh, as a eunuch. Now, he was in a chariot when Philip came to overtake him. In all likelihood, he would have been um, riding, uh, had a driver with him. This is a coin from about that period of time. You can see what the chariot might have looked like. There may have been, well been a driver, and he may have been in the back. He would have been reading a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. Um, they didn't have nice books like you and I have. Uh, they would not have been able to get out his phone or his iPad and looked out uh, Isaiah. In fact, they didn't have the chapter and verse divisions that you and I have. He likely would have had a scroll that may have looked something like this. Um, parts of the scrolls of, of Isaiah have been found in, in the Qumran area, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Almost all of Isaiah was uh, reproduced there. Um, though we don't know, it may well have been that a, as a rich, relatively well-to-do, powerful official he might have bought that scroll while he was in Jerusalem uh, to worship. You know, I've got more Bibles than I could count. If you ask me how many Bibles I have, I don't know. And, and you probably, you may be the same way. You probably don't have as many um, as I do, but uh, I've got a lot. But back in that day and time, when it was all written by hand, not everybody had a copy of the Bible. Not everybody had a scroll, and it was really reserved for people that were relatively well to do. And so, though I don't know for sure, it may well be that this is a copy that he would have secured for himself while he was in Jerusalem. And on the way back now, he's got this out and he's reading it. And as he's reading the scroll, what section of Scripture does he come to? Prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter... 53, particularly verses, I think, 7 and 8 are the ones that are alluded to here that talked about as a sheep that is led to the slaughter and like a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he opened on his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him, and who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. And so he's reading this part of Isaiah in Isaiah 53, a passage you and I know very well. We've read it many times at the Lord's table. It's the suffering servant passage. But his question is, when he's reading this, is what? Who's he talking about? Is, is he talking about himself? Is he talking about somebody else? Just exactly who is he, is he talking about? That's not a surprising question, by the way. Some of the prophets even had questions about what they were prophesying and looking into the timing and the exact uh, fulfillment of that Peter tells us. And so when Philip overtakes him, he asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And what does he say? How can I unless someone teach me? 
I tell you, that, that tells me something about this eunuch, really, but the attitude of anybody uh, that is going to be receptive to the gospel, he was a humble man. You know, he wasn't somebody, you ever know somebody when you're working on something, maybe even characterizes you b- before, it probably has characterized me before you're doing something, somebody says, can I help you? And you say, no, I, I've got this. You know, I don't need any help. It, there's sometimes we're, we're, we're a little proud to say what? No, I need help. Can you explain it to me? Can you do this for me? Not the Ethiopian eunuch. In his humility, he said, how can I unless someone guide me? And he invited Philip to come up into the chariot, and he sat down, and beginning at that scripture, what did he tell him? He told, told him the good news about Jesus. Uh, and that word, by the way, again, that word, euangelia, it means to proclaim the news. That's why the gospel is good news. It's about our, our salvation. And so he began right there at that passage, and he talked to him about Jesus. He began where he was in that scripture, and he taught him what he needed to do. So as they're going along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? So when, again, when he preached Jesus to him, what did he preach? Baptism. Because he came to water. And by the way, those that say, well, it couldn't have been uh, baptism by immersion because they're in a desert. That's what it was said in verse 26. That word desert, it doesn't mean dry sand and nothing but water. It's it's a deserted place. It was a place that was uninhabited. And all along that road, you can find places where there's enough water. In fact, enough to immerse because both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Time does not permit me to get into this very much. Verse 37. Um, is it real? Is it authentic? Uh, it, it, how many people have a translation that doesn't have verse 37 in it? You know, ESV doesn't have it in it. If you have an old American standard, it doesn't have it uh, in it. Um, if you have an NASB 2020, it doesn't have it in it. If you have an NASB 95, it probably has it bracketed, uh, indicating that they believe that it was an addition added uh, later on. So is Acts 8:37 real? Is it authentic? Does it belong there? Um, there are really a couple of questions. Number one, what do the manuscripts say? Um, and the, the oldest manuscripts don't have it, and the majority of manuscripts don't have it. If you look at a New King James and it says M and N U, uh, uh, omit this. That that means is the oldest manuscripts. That's N U, uh, Nestle Anlin United Bible Society Greek text, and majority don't have it. it. Means if you look at the sheer numbers, it's not it's not there. It's found in very few manuscripts. And that's the reason why, on a textual standpoint, that most newer translations, and even going back to the 1901 American Standard, which is a very good translation, omitted verse 37. Now, so if you ask me from a textual standpoint, what is the evidence? The evidence is against verse 37. Now, if you ask me, do I think it's authentic? That's a different question. And the answer is yes. And one reason I believe that is when you look at text, there are a number of things we we look at. Number one, we look at the manuscripts. But the other thing we look at is the writings of uh, the the early church writers. And Irenaeus, and uh, I can't remember what the other writer, Irenaeus is the one that stands out in my mind. Uh, But Irenaeus and, um, let me see if I can find the other writer, uh, quote Acts 8.37 within just a few years of the establishment of the church. And so that would seem to indicate its authenticity. Now, here's my point in the end of the day. Do you know what Acts 8, what, what doctrine or teaching is dependent on Acts 8.37? And the answer is none. So, you know, if, if it's not there, do we have other passages that show the importance of a confession in Jesus and that baptism is for belief in the Lord? Absolutely. So you have questions like this that arise sometimes over text. You know, is it authentic? Is it real? What manuscripts does it contain? Most scholars, conservative and otherwise, argue against Acts 8.37. I'm pretty confident it is probably authentic based on its early quoting from Irenaeus and, and other early church writers. However, if it's not there, you know what I believe about salvation? Exactly the same thing as if it's there. You know, so... Well, I quote Acts 8.37 in my preaching. Absolutely, I'm very comfortable doing that. But if somebody says Acts 8.37 is not there, okay, go to Romans 10.10. 10. 
you know, talks about with the heart man believes in the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made and salvation. So there's no, there's no doctrine that is dependent on... So same thing can be said about Mark 16 and the latter part of Mark 16. There's some debate, is, does it end at verse 8 or does it go from 8 to 16? If I was in a debate, I would defend the authenticity of Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 16 isn't in the Bible. Do you know what I believe about baptism? Exactly the same thing I believe right now. It, my, my belief is not dependent upon that one passage. Same thing about Acts 8, 37. But I want you to be aware of that because some of you may be reading through your Bible and you think, okay, I went from verse 36 to verse 37, uh, verse 38. Where's that? And that's the reason it is not there. It's footnoted or, or bracketed there. The eunuch was baptized, and then he went on his way rejoicing. He'd gone from a second-class citizen in the kingdom of the Jews to a first-class citizen in the kingdom of God. He had been saved, and his sins had been washed away. And uh, Philip was called away, and he went down, and he began to preach the gospel in other places. Really, Acts 9 next week is going to be another bridge conversion because the person... Everyone, to mark your uh, hymnals number 280 be the hymn of encouragement after today's lesson. Okay, I might have, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. I got sick one day, I was supposed to have the invitation, and so I was going to do this. But then all of a sudden I got sick, and so I didn't get to do it. It's very important that I get this across to you because there's going to be one or two of you people affected the same it was with me. Uh, Wilson Adams is a preacher. I got to hear over here at Stone Ridge, and he preached on this. And uh, he said, first of all, have you ever read a book, and all of a sudden you get tired of reading the book, so you take over and you go to the last two chapters and read those chapters? Know how it's going to end, so now I'm going to go back and read it now. So do you know where your life is going to be? Do you know when you're going to die? Do you know how you're going to die? Well, no, we don't. So it, sometimes it bothers us. Now, we're going to see in this, he gave this right here to us. His question was, God won't give you more than you can handle. Or will he? Now, this was by uh, Wilson Adams. I'm giving full credit to him. The reason why I'm doing this, my daughter has only seen me cry one time. It was at the funeral of my dad. Okay? Uh, nobody had ever seen me cry up until I heard this sermon. And the sermon, uh, there was five or six people left this, this sermon here crying. And you'll see why in a few minutes. But there's another person that's seen me cry now, Nola Christenberry, Jody's mother-in-law, because I started crying beside her. And you'll understand in a few minutes what it's all about. Okay? Now, we have to realize that God will take care of us. God God loves us. There's no doubt about that. And we've got to realize he's going to take care of us. You know, people have emotions. I saw it all straight back when I was playing football at Russellville High School. Get tired of the coach jumping on to him. He just took his fist and beat on that coach's chest, took his helmet off, and threw it about 20 yards and walked off the field. We have emotions. All of you have emotions. Okay? Uh, have you ever been to the point where I just can't? We're just going to stop. I can't handle this. I just can't handle it anymore. I just hope it doesn't happen. Have you ever been to that point? Not me. You never know. Okay, now, you know, what do you say to a person that has lost their spouse, lost their mother or dad, when you go to the funeral? What do you say to them? Oh, it's going to be okay. No, it's not. It's not because they have lost somebody that they love, and it really bothers them quite a bit. When I go to a funeral, I, I'll usually go up and I'll say, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. And that's what I do. 
And uh, if they need my help, I'll help them in any way I can. That's what I say. I can't solve their problem, you know. We just have to talk about this. What do you say to those, those parents whose little kids in school, a mass murder comes in and shoots those little kids for no reason at all? What do you say to them? Oh, it's going to be okay. No, it's not. No, that's a problem that they can't face, you know. And we just have to realize that. You know, <laughs> in college, I had a girl I went with for three and a half years, dumped me big time in the middle of my sophomore year. I was making A's and B's. I was going to be a best CPA in the entire world. Guess what? She dumped me. I wasn't expecting that. And I got where I couldn't handle that. It went from D, uh, A's and B's to D's and F's until I got kicked out of college. But I went to advanced ROTC summer camp. They told me to go ahead and go to it, Fort Hill, Oklahoma. I played their game so well that they got me back in college. I changed my major to mathematics. Mr. Price was an outstanding mathematics and I could do math. So I got in there and made D's and C's. So we're in good shape. Anyway, I had to make straight A's my last semester to graduate. And I, I had one class I could carry. I took athletic classes. Now, I'm not saying I encourage you to take athletic classes. I made straight A's except for one. I had to take a test and I flunked it. And the teacher called me and said, now, Joe, you flunked that test. I said, yeah, I know. My head was all messed up. And uh, she said, well, you deserve an A in here because you're supposed to only have like 20 hours lab work and you've got about 58. And she said, I'm going to go ahead and give you the A. I said, thanks so much. I graduated. Anyway, so this was something I couldn't handle. Now, what we're going to do is you say, well, the people in the Bible, they were able to handle it. Let's look at Job. We're going to look at three scriptures of Job, okay? And uh, the first one is Job 2.13, okay? So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Job had everything. He lost his family. He lost everything he could. And so, therefore, we say, did were these true friends? Sure. They sat with him for seven days and seven nights. Later on, we're going to find out the fact is they won't listen to what he says. But we see he had great grief. Now, here's the one that's a kicker. Job 3.11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Was Job able to handle this? No. Why didn't I die at birth in the womb? So we see Job was having a hard time. Then we see in Job 3.25 and 26. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Did Job, was he able to handle this? No, he had a hard time. Let's look at another example. Let's look at Jesus Christ now. Luke twenty-two forty-four, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You think Jesus... Was not having trouble with that? Sure he was. Have you ever seen anybody cry that had drops of blood coming out of their eyes? No. Jesus was bothered by it too. Now we'll look at another example of Paul, then we'll get on. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 9. This is Paul. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, here's the key. Verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. He said we need to trust in God. So we're going to see this is the main thing we're going to talk about here. God wants us to rely upon him. We see some scriptures on this. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God cares for you. Cast your burdens upon him. We also see in Psalm 55, verse 22, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You have got to rely upon Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, we also see in Matthew 11, verses 29 and 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, God... And Jesus Christ wants us to rely upon him. And so we'll be given things that we will be proud. Now, I've talked with some of y'all out here. I know you've had problems. 
My wife has dementia. She's out in that memory care facility out there. I was lucky in 2002 I bought a policy that covers this. It's a horrible disease. I cannot handle dementia. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't handle it. I just can't. So I go out there every morning at 7 o'clock, and I'll stay with her until she finishes taking her pills and eats, then she'll go to her room and go to sleep. Okay? Now, I don't know if you ever saw the, the uh, movie uh, Patch Adams. If I was a doctor, I would have to be like Patch Adams. You'll find that out hanging around me. Uh, I go out there and I try to get them laughing. All the patients, I try to get them laughing. I'll make fun of, of myself and things like that. And they'll get to laughing and so forth. And I feel like I've accomplished something because they do not understand. My wife, I went and sat by her bed the other day. And then all of a sudden she went to sleep and she woke up. She said, I didn't know you were there. About two, three minutes is all. See, it's a horrible disease. But we see... I have got into situation. I walk every morning with an 87-year-old man and about two or three more uh, up at Paragool. And uh, they, uh, the, the guy I walk with, mainly the 87-year-old, he lost his wife about six months ago. And he's having a very difficult time, okay? The other two have lost their wives and say three or four years later. But they come in, they say, we walk into the house and there's four walls. That's all there is. Guess what? I walk into my house, there's just four walls. That's all. See, I have a hard time handling this. When you've been married to somebody 52 years, you, you sort of think maybe they ought to be showing up here, but they don't. So that's just something you have to do. So we can see life will knock us down. I just can't handle some things, okay? Now, I got you, Joe. Here's a scripture that will defeat what you're saying. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I told you, Joe. No, no, no. That's temptation. It, he explained it this way. He said, you got a real pretty dog over there in the neighbor's yard. You want to go pet that thing, and he's on a short leash. So you start over there, and you've heard he growls and stuff like that, and guess what? Oh, he's a pretty dog. I can get along with him. You get too close, you get bit. All you had to do is turn around and go the other way. Resist temptation. Just turn around and go the other way, see? And so that, that's what he's talking about there, temptation. But we're talking about real-life stuff here, okay? Now, this was a, he had seen this somewhere, and he bought it. And it goes, it, it has more lines than this, but this is the three that we need. I believe in the sun, even if it's not shining, okay? I believe in love, even when I'm alone. Here's the key. I believe in God, even when he is silent. God will answer your prayers if you just ask him. You've got to be a member of his family. Ask him through prayer to solve this problem. I pray to God for this dementia thing, okay? God has not shown me much about it other than doing what I'm doing now. But God will answer the question. I don't know how he'll answer it. I don't know what's going to happen, but he will answer my prayer and help me get through this dementia problem. Okay? So that's what we got to remember. I believe in God even when he is silent. So this is what I've tried to get across to you today. We can't rely on ourselves. We must rely on God. So if you're having problems, if you've run into problems in your life that has bothered you so much, I started crying because I could not handle dementia, okay? But there are some of you that's been through a lot of hard times here, I'm sure, and you youngsters are going to be facing some things like that. When your parents pass away, if you love your mom and dad, it's going to affect you in big times. You have got to rely upon God to get you through that because you won't be able to handle it, Okay? If there's somebody who's not a Christian here, or they, you're going to have a chance to take this tonight. We see that as we go through life that uh, things may bother us and so forth. But as we go through, we see that uh, all we have to do is rely upon Jesus. You have to hear the word and believe it. You have to then realize that you're a sinner and repent of your sins. Then after that, you'll see that you have to confess his name before others so he can confess you for God the Father. And then you're baptized. You enter into the water as an old creature and come out as a new. Then you start studying and doing the best you can to follow what, so you'll have be Christ-like in the future. Okay? Now, if you're a Christian and you stumble, 
say you've sinned and you, if you need the prayers of the congregation here or if it's been a public sin or something like that and you need to make uh, a new of the things that you've done, come forth as we stand as we sing this song. announcements before we're led in dismissal song uh, it's going to be on the overhead only and our closing prayers will be by brother Matthew Webb certainly good to be here today especially those that are visiting we appreciate your attendance and your interest in spiritual things and if you have any questions we'll use our Bible to answer those uh, times of service as a reminder remember to be back here at Sunday 9 a.m. for Bible study 10 a.m. for worship and at 5 p.m. for worship again and then uh, there is an upcoming gospel meeting that we'll be having. There's some flyers in the back. It's with Brother Greg Gwynn, Sunday, October 29th through Wednesday, November 1st. We don't have any topics at this time, but we will have a good gospel meeting. I encourage you to invite your family and friends to it as well. As far as those on the sick list, there really isn't much of an update. Uh, just want to continue to pray for each other especially those that may be having spiritual difficulties as far as uh, other announcements that's about all I have this evening if you would let's be standing as we sing our closing song and then we'll have our closing prayer magnify oh magnify we'll sing all three verses of this song no. Magnify, oh magnify, oh magnify our God and Father. Magnify, oh magnify, oh magnify our God. He has made us in his glorious image. We ever strive to be like him. He alone is holy, he alone is right. Just cry aloud with gladness, our joy in him. Cry aloud with gladness, our joy in him. Oh, magnify, oh, magnify.
you would bow with me, please. Our most wonderful God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have this evening to come together and open up our Bibles and to study from your word. We pray at this time that you will be those that are sick of a physical nature, that the doctors overseeing them will bring them back to a full measure of health, if it will be your will. Most importantly, be those that are sick spiritually, that something may be said or done, that they will see the air of their way and turn to you or turn back to you before it's ever last, only too late. We pray, pray at this time that you will be with us as we leave this place, that you will take the things that we learn and that will make application to our life. And we pray that you will guide, guard, protect us, and keep us safe. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 